In a stool, three, tesserus, penta, hex, hepta, octo, nia, teca. Alrighty. Okay, look, take two. Still hot, still sweaty, still horrible. Still unable to. Oh, I might have that there. So my feet don't get too cold. Um, don't know. If I have myself side on a bit, hopefully, yeah. we will see. It's going to have to, still feels like it's just like, ah, all right, whoops. Okay, here goes nothing. Five, four, three, two, one. And today's reading is from Galatians chapter five, verses 1 and 13 to 25. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You were called to be free. But we have clicking sounds. Ah, air conditioner. Stop it. No, I'll just kill it. Oh no, we don't have to because... No, oh, just kill it. Just kill it. <coughs> All right, trying again. I'm gonna get hot and sweaty. That's all there is to it. All right. I hate to think how much battery I've wasted. Five, four, three, two, one. And today's reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and 13 to 25. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. And so we'll begin in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And g'day. It is so good to see you joining in. As we look at the Apostle Paul's letter to the Galatian church. 
I do hope you have your Bible with you to follow along with so you can check the context for yourself. And the first thing that we need to keep at the forefront of our minds as we unpack the message is how this letter is not directed towards non-Christians. Nope, for Paul's letter is directed towards Christians. And the other thing we modern people need to be aware of is that all the Christians were adult converts to Christianity, either from Judaism or other countries' religious practices. For at this point in time, nobody had grown up in a Christian home. Yes, the adult converts could have had families when they professed faith. As you see in Acts chapter 16, verse 15, when Lydia responded to Paul's message and do, 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 do. We go all the way back over here, wiping the sweat, moving that over there, down here. Five, four, three, two, one. She and the members of her household were baptized. And then later on, in verse 33, when Paul and Silas were in jail, we read a similar response as we turn the page and we go over here, checking the batteries. Five, four, three, two, one. The jailer and all his family were baptized. And so all the Christians Paul was writing to were adult newbies, trying to figure out how a Christian should behave. But at the same time, they had all this previous different religious cultural backgrounds that had formed their views, teaching them exactly what they needed to do to please their God and what is not allowed. And so, needless to say, things were going pear-shaped in the way they expressed their new Christian faith, leading to internal conflict as they tried to adjust their viewpoints on religious practices and creating strife between the other members as together they were trying to figure out just how their new faith in Jesus worked. And Paul did understand their dilemma. He had been a Pharisee of Pharisees, as he called himself. And so he understood the supreme importance religious law played in the Jewish faith. And because Paul understood their problem adjusting, he makes it easy for his readers to quickly get what his letter is all about as he starts chapter 1, verses 3 to 9, by bluntly stating, doo, 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 doo. we got to go back to one which is going to hide from us. Don't you do that one. Two, three, four, here. And we go five. Four, three, two, one. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God. Now, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, or anybody else preaches a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be eternally condemned. Paul is not taking a softly, softly approach with these new Christians. He is making no bones about it. You Galatian Christians are twisting the gospel until it is not even close to the gospel of salvation through Christ. That is not on. What you are doing is deadly serious stuff 
because it will lead to eternal condemnation. And so, assuming they wouldn't want to be eternally condemned, Paul continues on to explain the very real need to live according to the gospel, even going so far as to really laying it into the Galatian Christians in chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, with do here. Five, four, three, two, one. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You clearly saw Jesus Christ portrayed as crucified. I have a question for you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law, or was it by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now going to be made complete by the flesh? The Greek word flesh can mean the skin that covers our bodies, but it also carries a deeper meaning, describing the physical human nature, which here in these verses, some translations have helped us understand the deeper meaning by saying human effort or attempt. And then in chapter five, some have used the surrounding context to use another deeper meaning by translating flesh into sinful nature. So the Galatian Christians would be seeing the same word used across the letter, helping them to make the connection between what is said in the first chapter and how the concept of human nature develops throughout the letter into sinful nature. Paul then goes on in chapter 4 to give an illustration from Abraham's two sons explaining to the Galatians how one child, Ishmael, was conceived and born of the slave woman by human effort, trying to make the promise happen. Whereas Isaac was born to the free woman and only came about solely because of God keeping his promise. And therefore, as Paul in chapter 3, verse 26, told the Galatian Christians, they are five, four, three, two, one. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who were baptized into Christ, belong to Christ and are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And then Paul finishes chapter four by reiterating the point as he says, do, 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 we're turning the page again, we're checking the battery and we're going down here. Oh, well, wait a second. <coughs> oh, well, cough. Five, four, three, two, one. Therefore, you are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. And so the context for today's reading is how Paul is showing the Galatian Christians and anyone else who reads the letter that there is a radically different behavior between those people who call themselves Christians, but are actually slaves because they are living according to religious rules, rites, and traditions like circumcision, along with their sinful fleshly desires. And those Christians who are living in freedom because their greatest desire is to live by following the Spirit's direction. And we start to see this in chapter 5, verse 1 which recaps the point made in chapter one. And it is also a continuation from chapter four, verse 31, which it clarifies with, and I gotta blow a stinky, <laughs> it fair dinkum. Thankfully, I am learning how to handle all this. Five, four, three, two, one. Christ has truly set us free now. Make sure that you stay free and don't get caught up 
again in slavery to the law. Now, a couple of things we modern Christians need to adjust in our thinking. For often in today's society, when people talk about having freedom, their concept of freedom is being free from responsibility for their actions because they have the right to be happy. And so when choosing their behavior or actions that will ensure their happiness, they do not consider or care about whether other people will be hurt in the process. I can assure you this is not the type of freedom Paul is talking about, as you will soon discover. Secondly, the law Paul is talking about is not a country's civil laws that the government has decreed we have to obey. No, Paul is talking about religious laws. Those laws created by religious leaders that say, oh, you have to follow X rule and or perform these rites. Well, and like Jewish traditions, say like circumcision, to prove that you are a Christian and to ensure you are right with God. And Paul is demonstrating with them, trying to help them understand how even some of God's previous commands that he had given to the Israelites to show the world around them that they were his people are law-based. And so they end up enslaving you because you are never quite sure whether you have obeyed all the laws and requirements. Paul is telling them these laws do not give a Christian the freedom of faith found in the promise of salvation in Christ. Paul uses the Jewish religious requirement of male circumcision as a prime example. Now, Paul isn't saying circumcision is bad. At times, he had people circumcised to prevent unnecessary trouble. The issue Paul is contending with is the idea that after you have professed your faith in Jesus, the Christian Jews were telling the non-Jewish guys that they now needed to be circumcised to keep themselves in God's good books. So Paul is calling out this command and any other religious law that states something similar as, so wrong, it's not funny. For us modern Christians, we also find these religious man-made laws are in churches who tell their members things like, to belong to this church, you need to be doing such and such, like strict tithing and only to the, our church. Or you have to be able to speak in tongues, otherwise you are not a real Christian or whatever it is that they demand of their members who belong to their church. Paul calls all those demands and rules baloney. The Galatian Christians should know that is not what he had taught them about faith in Jesus. For as he goes on to remind them in verse 13, Five, four, three, two, one. You Christians have been called to live in freedom. Paul is making it crystal clear. It is not a Christian's external, outward, law-based actions that count. After all, earlier in chapter 2, verses 11 to 16, he had already informed them how, and we're going back, back, back to chapter 2. We go back to chapter 2, and it's 11 to 16, so over here. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, 
I said to Peter, in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now forcing these Gentiles to follow Jewish traditions? Come on, both you and I are Jews by birth. Not so cold sinners like the Gentiles. Yet we know that no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. That a person is only made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. And that is why we have believed in Christ Jesus. Paul was really wanting them to get the point how Christians who are in Christ have been called to be free from any religious, legalistic laws that enslave you. And then Paul goes, but, and it is a big but, for you see, there is another dangerous way to get yourself enslaved. For as verse 13 goes on to say, have a drink, have a drink, ding, ding, ding. Ah. Five, four, three, two, one. But do not use your freedom to indulge your sinful nature. Paul is laying it on the line, going, don't you even dare to think that your freedom from the law allows you to continue indulging in your previous sinful ways of living. Seriously, it just doesn't work that way. And we see when Paul wrote to the Romans, which according to scholars could be written a couple of years later or around the same time as he wrote to the Galatians. In chapter 6, verses 1 to 2, how he then further shreds the false thinking that some Christians get that our freedom means we can continue sinning by asking a rhetorical question and giving an emphatic negative answer with. Did I say, what did I say? What are we, Bible 3? Did I say Romans? I have a terrible feeling I might not have. Oh well, we'll see who's listening. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Should we keep on sinning so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. How can we, who died to sin, still live in it? And back in Galatians, Paul finishes verse 13 and with verse 14, now provides the Christians a positive counterbalance to change from their sinful living by saying, here we go back, 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 rub the nose, pick the nose, whatever you need to do, 13 to 14, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, rather serve one another in love for the entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbour as yourself. And the Galatian Christians would have remembered how they had heard when Paul was first in Galatia, proclaiming the good news of freedom in Christ, that in Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 to 39, there was this expert in religious law who had tried to trap Jesus with this question. Do, 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 we're going to four. It's back here. And four is here. Ah, it's about the same size on the same pages. Five, four, three, two, one. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus had replied with, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. So the Galatian Christians knew that Paul was taking them back to the very heart of the gospel in Jesus' teaching on love, being the ultimate aim of all 
of God's commands. How the gospel isn't a law demanding stuff like circumcision to prove their faith. Just no. The gospel is all about Christians loving God with all their being and treasuring their freedom found through his grace and their faith in Christ doing all the hard work in saving them to pour out God's love towards their neighbour. Now, Paul's letter has had the tone of a legal brief, using rhetorical questions and then countering them with statements to prove his point that it was futile attempting to walk in faith by obeying the law to gain kudos with God. Now, before we get carried away thinking we should be getting rid of all religious rules, rites and traditions, no, that is not what Paul is saying. He is saying the law is good for pointing people to their need for grace and then leading them to faith in Christ. This promise of the free gift of grace through Christ's death and resurrection leads to a radically different way of having a relationship with God that makes Christians stand out from other countries' faith in their gods. And then we find from verse 14 onwards how Paul delivers a statement to the Galatians and then gives an opposing viewpoint that actually validates the original statement, which is what we find after verse 14. Do, 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 do. Back to Galatians. <laughs> five, five, five. Ah, right. right, checking batteries. Gee, it took us a lot less time to get there than I thought. That's all right. <coughs> five, four, three, two, one. The entire law comes down to love your neighbor as yourself. And then in verse 15, Paul shows what the opposite of loving your neighbor looks like and it ain't pretty as he explains I can blow my nose <coughs> five four three two one if you keep on biting and devouring each other watch out or you will be destroyed by each other obviously from this vivid analogy Paul knew that the Galatian Christians were engaging in some intense, bitter infighting amongst themselves. From the way the letter is addressing the issue of keeping religious laws, we could reasonably assume that the arguments were over which rights and rules they should adhere to that led to the vicious bad-mouthing and spitefulness. But there may have also been other issues that were compounding the problem to the point that their attitude towards each other had become really ugly and very nasty. Paul was letting them know that their hard-heartedness towards each other was tearing them apart and had got to the point that they as Christians were close to being destroyed. And so he gives them the antidote to self-destruction in verses 16 to 18, as he says, wipe the sweats from your face. Oh, can I get some? Five, four, three, two, one. Live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
These verses are loaded with so much meaning that it is hard to condense it down. But the basic nuts and bolts is the order in which Paul announced that the first and most important promise Paul gives is to live by the Spirit. And that way you will not gratify your fleshly sinful desires. There is no way you can think, I can do this. If I just work hard enough, I will overcome my fleshly sinful desires that lead me to hurt others. Paul is going, sorry sunshine, it doesn't work that way. You've got to choose to live by the Spirit. As a new Christian, you are entering a huge nasty battle where your fleshly sinful nature is constantly in direct conflict with God's Spirit all the time. Paul is not sugarcoating what the Christian life is like. The spiritual battle will be constant for the rest of your life. And if you think that religious rules and rights will help you, think again. For the only way we have any hope of winning against the desires of our fleshly sinful natures is to deliberately every minute of every day choose to live by the Spirit. Paul is affirming to them that their faith in Christ means they are not on their own, helpless and powerless to overcome their sinful desires because when you live by the Spirit you are not going to be a legalistic law-based Christian. Instead, you will be living with the Spirit helping you to overcome your selfish wants and be able to show God's love to your neighbour. And then, in verses 19 to 21, Paul expands upon the characteristics of a sinful nature, describing how... We'll move this a bit more. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred and discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. Now before you get all excited and think, aha, something I do that is sus is not listed here, so I don't have to worry about giving it up. Mm. Perhaps you should stop and look at the wording right at the end of the long list and the like. In other words, this list describing 15 aspects of the sinful nature is representative of the various ways sinful, rebellious people live under their fleshly desires when they don't seek the help of the Spirit. The list describing aspects of the sinful nature starts with sexual sins, covering sexual acts from prostitution to all sexual lusts that are the opposite of what a loving sexual relationship looks like, and includes depraved sexual acts like pedophilia or sex with animals two indiscriminate sexual promiscuity, one night stands, etc. And all of these sexual sins and more was so common in the Greco-Roman world that they were considered normal sexual behaviour. Which sadly doesn't sound much different to what is happening now in our modern world. And what Paul tells the Galatian Christians is just as relevant for today's Christians. The Christians who refrain from sexual sins will stand out from the crowd, which is a convincing demonstration to the people around you of the power of the Spirit to help a person overcome their sinful sexual desires. Then Paul lists idolatry and witchcraft, both of which and their occult byproducts would have been 
a big part of some of the Christians' previous pagan lifestyles. And Paul is reminding them, don't fall back into those sinful habits of worshipping other gods or looking to mediums or Uji boards for help. For God's spirit is way stronger than any of their idols or witchcraft. And the spirit is the only way to go for real help in overcoming your sinful nature. And Paul follows that up with eight acts of a person's sinful nature that causes a person to believe they have more knowledge about what other things God requires than what is in the gospel message, which leads to strife and animosity with other people. For it's a no-brainer that... Oh, have a quick drink. Oh. Where are we? Down here. Oh. <coughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy are always the starting point that lead people to eventually keep on biting and devouring each other until you are both destroyed emotionally and spiritually and even physically. And of course, these strife-filled sinful desires are the polar opposite of what love will do for people. For as Paul succinctly told the Corinthian Christians in chapter 8, verse 1, how, what number are we up to? Bible 5. <laughs> Over here. <coughs> mm. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Knowledge puffs a person up. Love builds up. And then Paul finishes his list to the Galatians with, and we're going back to one, two, two, two. Do, 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 do. Five. No, no, we're still over here. Five, four, three, two, one. Drunkenness, orgies. And back then, the two were often paired together due to the Roman god Bacchus, who was well known for the drunkenness which accompanied his orgies. And so by finishing with orgies, Paul is circling back to the sexual sins at the beginning of the list. To give the Galatian Christians a picture of a sandwich full of all the putrid, rotten, smelly, contaminated sins their human nature desires to indulge in. That will, like a stinking gross sandwich, make you spiritually sick. And then Paul lets them know this is not new news to them, for he finishes verse 21, telling them how he is uh, <coughs> really, all right, really, <coughs> can you get off my throat? Five, four, three, two, one. Warning you, like I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul shows them what the Spirit can really do for them. How a Christian living by the Spirit will show. Oh, I don't know. <coughs> what are we showing? Not much at all. Five, four, three, two, one. The fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Spirit being from God. God has no problem in filling us with God's love and thereby enabling us to image God's love that has been shown to us, Christians, to the people around us. And it is by having the fruit of God's love showing in our lives that flows through to enable Christians to show the rest of the fruits of the Spirit in their living under the Spirit. 
For if you have God's love flowing into and out of you to other people, then you not only experience the joy you felt when you realize just how much God does love you, but you get this awesome double joy as the people around you also discover God's love for them. And the peace the Spirit gives us is nothing like the way we modern people think of peace as being the end of war or arguments where we have been devouring each other. The Spirit's fruit of peace comes from our faith in how Christ, through his death and resurrection, has given us the gift of salvation. And so we no longer need to strive to follow religious rules, rites and traditions to be children of God. And the fruit of patience is the perfect antidote to our strife-filled fleshly desire to have our own way. For when we have experienced God's love and want to image that love to others, then the Spirit helps us to not be quick to jump to conclusions or to lose our temper. And the Spirit's fruit of patience also helps us refrain from giving in to selfish ambition. So we can be patient, waiting for what God thinks is best for us. All of which helps us Christians to avoid disagreements that create factions among our fellow Christians. And now with the Spirit having given you the fruit of God's love, joy, peace and patience, you will see a rapid growth in the fruits of kindness, goodness, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Again, all of these fruits are the total opposite to the desires of the sinful nature. If we let the Spirit grow these fruits in our lives, then we need not worry about being a gross, disgusting, sin-filled sandwich. For as verse 23 ends and 24 confirms, another blow of the nose, Five, four, three, two, one. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and desires. So instead of Christians being like a sin-filled sandwich that will make them sick and end in death and keep us out of the kingdom of God, that no one around them would want to taste Paul is showing the Galatian Christians that because we belong to Christ and have the fruit of the Spirit working in our lives, this is like being a sandwich full of really good, yummy things that people want to taste and see how good your sandwich is. And so you get to share the Spirit's fruit with those around you, bringing them into the same joy of a spirit-filled life, where they and us will, as verse 25 says, <coughs> oh, really, I'm running out of tissue here, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, live by the Spirit and let us continue keeping in step with the Spirit. And then you would think verse 26 is giving a warning to those Christians who are living according to their sinful nature. But it's actually directed at the Christians who are living by the Spirit. As Paul gives the Galatian Christians, and by association, us reading his letter, this stern warning. Ah, <coughs> really? Five, four, three, two, one. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. It is all too easy to be unaware that we have become proud and puffed up because we Christians are displaying the fruits of the Spirit, more so than other Christians. And so we begin provoking them to do better, forgetting 
that when we came to believe by faith what Jesus promises us, that we then entered the spiritual conflict between our natural sinful desires and living by the Spirit and how often our natural sinful desires won the battle. But how as we persevered and kept practicing living by the Spirit until we were able to keep in step with the Spirit, well, most of the time, and in that Paul gives a clear warning to not be envious of those who look like they are doing a better job at living by the Spirit, for they appear to hardly step out of line. Paul is warning us to not go by appearances. Don't start envying them, for you don't know how many times they lost the battle and what battle scars they are wearing because they kept persevering and practicing walking in step with the Spirit. And Paul is stressing the point that it is not good when Christians become conceited and start provoking non-believers by challenging them to show the fruits of the Spirit in their lives. For then they are not seeing you image God's love and the fruits of the Spirit in your life. And so they are not going to want to try the fleshly, sinful nature you are showing them. For after all, it's not much different to their fleshly nature. Except yours is being judgmental and critical. Now, just like Jesus did in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22, with the young man who wanted to know what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Wait a minute, we didn't put in a thingy. All right, we'll go back here and we'll start again. That'll do. Five, four, three, two, one. What good thing must I do to get eternal life? Jesus answered, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. The man asked, which ones? Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus let him leave. He didn't change what he had said to make it more palatable. And the same goes for Paul. He leaves the Galatian Christians to either reject his warning and continue living according to their sinful desires. And because they have been warned, they then cannot complain when they do not inherit the kingdom of God. Or they can take his warning to heart and start living by the Spirit, understanding that God's Spirit and their natural desires will be in constant conflict. But how God's Spirit is stronger than their natural sinful desires. And so if they persevere, they will find that they are walking in step with the Spirit and by having the fruits of the Spirit in their lives, they will be well on the way to truly imaging God to the people around them. And so following Jesus and Paul's example, I leave it up to you to decide which spirit you are going to choose to live under, the gross, rotten, 
stinky sandwich of fleshly sinful desires that leads to spiritual death and rejection from the kingdom of God? Or will you choose to live by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit and having the awesome fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control being clearly seen in your life and so showing the people around you the incredible power of the Spirit so that they desire to have the Spirit of God active in their life too. Amen. Well, things considered, that seemed good, unless the crying baby.